So John is going to speak to us this morning about the connection of water and prairies. Thanks, John. Okay, well, thanks very much. It's a very great honor to be able to come and, uh, and uh, talk to you. Many of you have heard me many times, and so there'll be a little repetition uh, for, uh, for you there. And uh, hopefully uh, I can uh, bask in the uh, sunlight that uh, Carol's uh, provided us here. So my, I might seem a little... Uh, better than uh, usual. Uh, I am a, uh, I'm a little bit different than most of you. I'm a geoscientist. I'm a soil scientist by training. Uh, so I know about dirt. And I'm the only one that can say dirt, right? You all can't say that. Four letter word. Uh, but I do know some plants, not a whole lot. I know what a forb is and a grass, that kind of stuff, right? So, uh, and this also is the last hurrah uh, before I retire. And, and I shouldn't say retire, I'm going to the next phase. So uh, I'm going to sort of, maybe this is kind of like a capstone. Is, I'm going to present a lot of the work that I've done on wetlands and prairies. Because wetlands and prairies in this part of the world, they all go together. They are not uh, separate. So this picture here, this is the whole story right here. You know, we could just, just look at that and you got the whole deal, right? And uh, which is actually pretty good because I always run over and I always, I rarely get to give all the slides, you know, that I have. They don't call me the Nobel professor for nothing, right? So, so you, everybody knows the story. Everybody knows what's going on, right? Those houses are not in retreat. They're coming this way, okay? This is our story. This is what's going on. So I'm going to have three messages for you today. I got three pieces of news. I got some bad news. I got some good news and I got some iffy news, all right? So let's start with the bad news is we've lost a whole lot of prairie and forest and everything else. We've lost an unconscionable amount. That's the very bad news. The very good news is there's still a lot of stuff out there. There's a whole lot of stuff and there's some big patches and we'll get into that little debate of big and small and all that stuff, okay? So that's the good news. The iffy news that could go either way is we are the ones we've been waiting for. It's all up to us. No one will do this for us. This is us. And we will lose, right here in the upper Gulf Coast of Texas, the largest and most significant amount of prairies on our watch in the next 20 years. We are going to double in population. And if the present uh, trends continue, the prairie, the Katy Prairie is gone, the Damon Prairie, which you may not know about yet, but we'll explain that to you. That's gone. It's all gone. So it's up to us. The, federal, the feds aren't going to come and save us. Not now, particularly, but even in the next regime. They're not coming. Okay? The state is not coming. This is us. And we're going to need every trick of the trade that we can come up with to save our legacy and to help ourselves become native to this place, which is the word that, uh, that's how Wes Jackson talks about uh, becoming indigenous. So I'm actually leaving now. When I leave, I'm going to a country that his name says the land of many trees, Guatemala. That's where I grew up. And so I'm going back to those trees. That, that's where I was native to that originally. I came here, this flat prairie at first didn't quite figure out what's going on, but I did my best to become native to this place and I embraced it. And I find just as much grandeur in that ocean of prairie as in those steep volcanoes uh, where I grew up. So it's been a real pleasure to become a little bit native to this place. So the overall message then is it's not too late. It's not too late, but the hour is fast arising, fast upon us. Uh, when, if we don't make decisions now, we will lose this all. On our watch, more than anyone who has gone uh, before. All right, so let me give you a little uh, introduction, especially for those of you that are, are new here, the Master Naturalists. How many Master Naturalists we got here today? Okay, and you have heard me, you've heard me say this so many times, so let's just do it again. All right, why not? Is that the, there we go. All right, so this is our little corner of the world, southeast Texas, and uh, we've got the, the two uh, areas that I focus on. These are geologic areas. Uh, the Quaternary, or, or in other words, the last two million years, are these, the Lissy and the Beaumont Formation, 
All of these were laid down as massive uh, rivers, fluvial deltaic systems, uh, we might uh, call it. And these areas, so this is just a, a representation from many years ago of uh, how this landscape is put together here. Let's see, I hit that wrong there. Uh, these areas here are a lot of prairies up here as well, but the land is tilted up there uh, through the warping of the sediments that come down. These guys are flat as a pancake, flat as a pancake without baking soda, okay? So it's flat because baking soda actually has the, you know, regular pancakes actually have a little concave, the, flat. It's just flat, okay? That's very significant, and that's why we have a lot of wetlands here uh, as well. The Lissy Formation is just a little, a little steeper. This is four feet to the mile, that's five feet to the mile. Of course, we have our flat areas here as well, but these are our main areas where we have our uh, wetlands and our prairies, etc. Our landscape is a fluvial landscape. Right now, where we sit here, this is the Brazos River uh, flowed here. And in fact, I like to tell my students, you are standing on the Rocky Mountains. Did you know that? Yes, you are. These sediments that were right here a long time ago, several iterations ago, they were in the Rocky Mountains. So you're standing in, you know, tremendous places here. But we are built, this, it's this fluvial deltaic nature. It's not a delta, but they were these vast rivers that flowed across uh, these uh, flat areas that we're talking about here. And so, uh, the, the, the structure is just as any river system that you get. You have uh, meander belt ridges and you have back swamps. And we see all of that here today. And we have different kinds of prairies and forests and whatever on these different areas. So I'll focus a little bit first on what we call these meander belt ridges. This is actually of the Mississippi, but even the smaller systems have that. So this is where the landscape has been built up. It's become somewhat concave uh, and rivers as they are wont to do, move back and forth on the landscape. They slice and dice, right? They have oxbow channels, they have this and that. This is the Trinity River actually up near uh, Dallas. And you can see that there's a, there's, a, there's a story written into this landscape as we see where this river has flowed and things have been sliced and diced a little bit. Uh, this is a geology map from the Bureau of Economic Geology. Might not be super clear, but you can see this is, the, this is the Beaumont Formation here. Here's Houston, here we are down here somewhere. Actually, a little more like here. These lighter areas are these ancient meander ridges. These are the courses, in this case, of the ancient Brazos River, which flows here and now, but during the uh, Holocene and, and beyond, and before, they flowed here. And so these are the ancient, these lighter areas. Uh, here, for example, is in League City an area, these are where the rivers flowed, and these are the back swamp area, these very clayey areas. Uh, very clay, in fact, we have, this is where if you have a house here, you have had foundation problems, or if you haven't had them, you will have them sooner or later. Uh, this is just a, another close-up picture of the kind of landscape here. This is that uh, meander ridge coming down, there's League City is right in here. It's not a connected stream anymore, even though people do call it the Magnolia Creek. But this is where the ancient Brazos flowed. All of these are ancient courses of the Brazos. And these areas are then are the, are the back swamps. And we have characteristic prairies on each of those kinds of landscapes. So get that right. Okay, so this is, all right, this, is, this, shows, this shows this little guy here. Here's this ancient meander scar here. Here it is on the landscape. This is a tremendous area. It's the Dick Benoit Prairie Preserve. Is that right? And we have some... Master naturalists that remember that, one of our great uh, super volunteers, really. But you can see this landscape here, the ancient river flowing. Here's the Pimple Mounds, the Mima Mounds, as they were called there. A wonderful landscape, one of the best prairies left around. But there's some encroachment happening and will continue to happen. This is a color infrared photo uh, of a uh, prairie out in Richmond, Texas, just to our, our west. And you can see that it's quite a complex landscape. So this was a, on a meander belt ridge, right? This is where the, the river flowed. And so it's like a whole history that's been happening here. This is like a, what, what do geologists call a palimpsest, or a tablet on which is written the history that went before. It's not, it's overwritten several times, so that's what makes it very uh, unique. So these darker areas are the, uh, what we call prairie potholes, uh, or coastal prairie potholes, if you're sensitive to that kind of an issue. 
Uh, and then we've got these little uh, pimple mounds in here. And we have uplands in here. We've got wetter areas. We really have quite a complex la landscape. A landscape that was formed first and foremost by the rivers that flowed here. They sliced and diced. It's hard to see sometimes exactly you know, where those channels might have gone. And that's because in addition to the fluvial process that happened, the mastodons were rolling around in here. And they were wallowing around. And oh, did they wallow. They made some big wallows. Then after them came the buffalo. They didn't wallow quite as big as the mastodons, but they wallowed nonetheless. Okay? And sometimes people call these uh, buffalo wallows. And then on top of that, the wind blew. And so we get this very intricate, unique uh, landscape that I like to call a chance melody because it's the chance of all these things happening. So it's a very rich landscape with a lot of short range uh, diversity. So the, the, the biggest drop that we're going to have from the top of a pimple mound, the top of the highest pimple mound, to the bottom of the deepest prairie is maybe two feet. <laughs> right? That's a nosebleed for us. <laughs> I was getting a little dizzy watching Carol stuff all these, you know, so I felt like I was going to fall over and throw up or something. I was, oh, gee whiz. So, it and when you drive by, it just looks like this flat thing. But after you become nativized, you become native to this place, you, those little changes start to mean big things to you. So this is a tremendous short range diversity for the plants, for the flora, the fauna that live here. And it's, and it's not only is it all within a couple of feet, it's within a very short distance. Here's a, a road, these oil filled roads that give you a, an idea of the size of what's going on. So these really are world class landscapes. Now, it's difficult for us to work in this area because we have the burden of what, what we call the burden of flat land, right? So it's hard enough for us, you know, we, we had something like you got in Missouri, some, you know, some hills and dells, or something like the Garden of the Gods in, in uh, you know, Colorado, maybe we could, you know, we'd have a little bit more of a chance. But as it is, this is what we got. So when you're out there driving around, that's, that's what you see if you slow down, right? So this is our prairie. Mainly this is a wetland part. There's some upland prairies over there. These are these uh, pimple mounds or mima mounds. They tend to travel in packs. So you can see them all out there. And then there's a gallery forest. So we love our trees too. We love trees and prairies. We love the whole thing. It's all together here. So uh, this is a unique piece of the prairie. This is out on what we call the Damon Prairie. Uh, so this is just a regular color uh, photo, not color infrared like the other one. And here you can actually see uh, very easily this nice, uh, what's an actual paleo channel. And then we've got potholes all over the place. And of course, this is upland prairie uh, out here. And if you, this is what some folks at the Conservation Fund did for us a few years ago, working with the magic of their GIS systems and a... Uh, digital uh, mapping here. So this shows the convex concavity, con convexity and concavity of our landscape. This is that same area that we were looking at right there. So you can see that we've got, again, these, so these the purple areas are the wetter areas, the greener areas are the drier areas. So again, short range complexity in a landscape like this. This is the landscape we are about to lose, Highway 99 is going to come, the grand, the grand parkway is going to come steaming right through there. And we'll get into a little bit the big versus the small. Okay, I'm sensitive, very sensitive to the uh, small issue, but I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to make a strong point for the big stuff. Uh, we need them both for sure, uh, but we've got big stuff left here, and that's what I'm going to talk about here uh, shortly. Maybe the next one. Okay, in addition to the Meander belts, which is what we talk about most, and this is where most of the prairies are, but we do have these back swamps. So that was where farther from the river, the clayey stuff uh, precipitated out there, uh, settled out, and um, a little bit more difficult because so much of it, that's what went preferentially for agriculture because that's deep, rich clays, very nice, you, you know, back before they, uh, hurt, you know, real plowed them so much, I mean, the first folks that came here could run their fingers through that. It was like running through butter because that's so much organic carbon. So there's some good chances for mitigation left there. 
This is a kind of landscape that maybe some of you have heard me talk about, the Gilgai landscape. I mean, if you confuse this with the prairie pothole, not to be confused. So this is Gilgai, much shorter range. Those potholes we're looking about could be acres in size. These are just a few so, uh, uh, square feet, really. So these are the micro highs and the micro lows. That's how these things resolve these tremendous pressures, these shrink-swelling uh, soils. We are champions at that. Uh, in the world. This is what a soil profile looks like uh, there. You can see this almost a plastic extrusion where it pushes up that subsoil and that's how we get these, mema, these not mema mounds, these are the Gilgai micro highs and micro lows. So again, this is what cracks the foundation. The first thing you, the easiest way for you to know whether you're on Gilgai or not, if you have you had foundation repair. How many of you have had foundation repair here? Not a few, okay. You stayed away from the Gilgai, good. You just don't, okay, this just cracked, there you go, okay. So there are a few native areas of these uh, left. Um, so I don't know, is Mike Lang here? Mike's not here. Anyway, they've got a great spot they found uh, just outside of uh, Angleton. Uh, so it's very rare to find these. So this, is a, this was a Gilgai prairie that had never been plowed. I mean, those are rare. They're, you don't have any choice about big or small. It's what you got, and that's, that's all she wrote. And uh, some of you that are from around here, this is uh, the uh, Johnson Space Center, this little antenna thing they have sticking up there. See all that there? That is the Gilgai, the Gilgai Prairie, and it's actual prairie. They've, I, don't, I don't think that's ever been land level. That's just off of Saturn Boulevard. They, they mow it. That's all they do. They don't burn it, but they mow it. So it's actually a pretty nice a prairie out there. Uh, these uh, are actually what determined the uh, placement of cities in Texas. We've got the Blackland Prairies that come down uh, up here from Oklahoma and zoom all the way here. So we've got Dallas, Dallas mainly, a little bit of Fort Worth, uh, Austin, San Antonio, and down. Uh, and then we're the Blackland Coastal Prairie over here. So if you've got foundation problems, you live in these areas. Okay? So the next question then that we spent a lot of time on trying to quantify, well, how much exactly are we losing? You know, we drive around and you say, well, we've lost stuff. Yeah, we have lost stuff. So it's been important for us to try to quantify that. And we can easily do that because this, we have the National Wetland Inventory uh, here that we can look at. So I'm going to quantify wetland loss. But again, remember, here on the flat coastal prairie, you can't talk about wetlands without talking about the upland prairie. It's a system, okay, all together. But we have resources like the National Wetland Inventory that have mapped out these wetlands for us. They, they don't get it all. So these darker areas are all wetlands, but they missed quite a bit. All of this is wetland too. In fact, they might have missed 60%. But what they called wetland was pretty sure that it was wetland. So we can use that. Here's the summary of our data up through 2010. We got a lot, you know, we should be doing some more. Uh, Harris County is the epicenter, of course, of growth in our area. Here we were losing upwards of 30%, now it's likely 40% of some kinds of these emergent wetlands out on the prairie, and the prairies that go with them, right? So we, we're losing an unconscionable amount, and the, and the counties surrounding now, Pear, you know, Pearland here in Brazoria County, Northern Galveston County, all of these folks, right? And we're moving in this direction, right? So the Katy Prairie, not so much out in, uh, in this direction. The next question is, well, you know, we've got the Clean Water Act, right? That saves us? No, it doesn't. So, so I say, we are the ones, right? So just to make it uh, quick here, uh, we looked at, we, we took a, 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 a large sample of a very large database, all the permits uh, since, uh, I think, uh, at least maybe 95, and looked at, on paper, was there compliance? Did they have the requisite monitoring going on? Were they following the rules, right? Well, don't, uh, th this, uh, large, this is the, this is mi all mitigation, which includes actually avoidance, but this is the mitigation where they, you know, filled a wetland. So out of compliance, 68, 61% of our sample of uh, just over 62 uh, permits, 61%. Not, not a complete record, right? Not, not, in other you would go in there and there's not a record that they've done the mitigation they're supposed to do. If you fill a wetland, you're supposed to mitigate it. Again, 
prairies and wetlands go together. I'm focusing on wetlands, but wetlands is the only law we have that sort of, kind of, at least ostensibly, could save some wetlands. But at least on paper, it's not happening. Uh, most things are not getting mitigated. And on top of that, then we also took a smaller sample where we actually went out into the field. The other one that I showed you was just a paperwork kind of trail. Then we said, well, let's take a little bit of a smaller sample and let's go to the field. And we randomly selected this. We worked with our friends up at Hark in the woodlands and we chose uh, a, lot, a fewer number, I think just about less than 20. And we classified them as failure, so 23% were just abject failure. In other words, you went out there in the field, there's either nothing, or it's all Chinese tallow, or most likely just nothing out there at all. And then we said, well, there were some that we could, okay, let's, we call those success, you know, maybe it wasn't the best wetlands, but something was constructed, 15%. So then we devised this kind of intermediate, well, we called it the failure partial success, and then we maybe a partial success. So we're looking at about 50% that don't have a very good record. And even these partial successes, we were being very generous with our uh, categorization there. So you read the papers, you see what's happening with the Clean Water Act, it's going downhill, it's not getting better. Uh, but but even, the, even the Clean Water Act under the Obama rules were not particularly helping us because the local Corps of Engineers considers that all those prairie potholes are not hydrologically connected to downstream waters. Now we have data that shows that they are, we've given it to them, and they just kind of, well, you know, we'll, get, we'll get around to it. So stay tuned on that story. Again, that's why I say this is up to us. Nobody is gonna come and save us. So the next question then, all right, we've lost a whole lot. Is there anything left worth worrying about? So my message to you today is yes. There's a whole lot left that is worth worrying about, even as this development comes, whoa, let's see, comes our way here. And this is that same, this is actually that same uh, meander scar that I showed you uh, in, a, in the, uh, another picture. So a few years ago, we partnered up with HGAC, our local COG, the Houston Galveston Area Council, to map all the remaining habitat all the remaining habitat over 100 acres in size. Now, did we catch a lot of flack on that? Yes, we did. I know there's folks who would give me flack right now if I gave them time, but I won't. So <laughs> the reason we did that, yes, there are a lot of wonderful places that are five acres, that are 10 acres, but when you're mapping an area this big, you do not have time to map all of that because the smaller your mapping unit, the longer it takes. So 100 acres in the literature is about where you start to get some, some real ecology. Not that the smaller areas don't have their value. Yes, they do, they absolutely do. But when we're looking, when we're talking about the Houston-Galveston area, then we gotta focus on the stuff that shows up. You're native to where you live, you have some areas. Yeah, you take those small areas that are important because as Carol said, they have seed sources, a lot of reasons to do that. So I don't have a lot of time to spend on this map just to say that this was done through air photo interpretation. This was not running around in the field. Okay, as I, you remember from those photographs that I showed you, you can see those prairie pothole complexes. They stand out, okay? The, the, the uh, Gilgai stuff did not stand, we didn't even try because you have to, you'd have to go in very close uh, to see them. And there's just not that many. So we mapped those, we mapped the forests. Forests, of course, are easy to map on a, uh, from aerial photography. So this lighter green stuff here are our coastal prairies. And we do actually have quite a bit left, okay? We're not totally depauperate. And, and the deal here is that we've got a lot more, at least in Texas, okay, than other places. Because it was the peri-urban stuff that wasn't getting hit from either suburban sprawl, right, moving in this direction out, or land leveling for agriculture, which was happening out in the inter, interland, interlands. So we have this very interesting kind of area close into the city that was less plowed, right, and less abused than other, other places. So this was easy for us uh, to map this out. There are big pieces left. If we didn't have big pieces, I'd say, okay, let's not worry about the big pieces, but we got big pieces. We don't just have big pieces, we got big freaking pieces, okay? 
this is, these areas are like arcs, right? It's an arc into the future because there's a lot more that we don't know about these prairies than we do know. In fact, there's more than we can even imagine that happens in these prairies. We cannot understand. So as Carol said, we need a really good dose of humility to recognize that we don't know nothing. So we need to save those small areas, but those big areas, they're big enough that emergent properties happen that don't happen at the smaller scale, right? Doesn't mean we don't need those smaller ones, but there's stuff happening at the bigger scale. And these are the areas that are most under threat now. They're a unique, irreplaceable legacy, okay? So these big areas, like out on what we call the Damon Prairie, this little area here, 50 to 70,000 acres of never plowed area. I say, well, that's not pristine. It's not what it was in 1820. Well, yeah, we get that. But it's something that cannot be, that we can't make. We can't replicate that. Okay, this kind of an area. Uh, so we need to be mindful of that. And the Highway 99 is going to be coming through here. And then there's, a, there's also a prairie parkway. Did you know that? That's beyond the Grand Parkway. So get ready. There's, you know, it keeps, keeps going around and around. Now, some of these areas are already under protection. You know, San Bernard, uh, Anahuac out here. But a lot of this has not been uh, preserved. So you can see down here, there's eight pieces of greater than 10,000 acres each, okay, that have not been land level. Now again, remember I come to this from a geoscientist point of view, but there are, so a little bit, I'm looking more at the way the landscape is built, but out here on the Damon Prairie, you know, we've got the Nash Prairie, this little beady piece that's recognized as one of our great crown jewels here, and then the Mowatney Prairie up there. So not pristine, but if you've never been land level, at least you've got that template that irreplaceable template. You know, we do a lot of restoration out of Sheldon. You all are familiar with the Sheldon Sipix method. Is Andy here, by the way? Oh, Andy Sipic's not here, okay. But we've actually learned how to, uh, you know, recover those buried soils. And, and we, we, some, we replicate somewhat the, the, the heterogeneity and the diversity was the, that was there, but not completely. Okay, so we've got to save what we got. Uh oh, is that bell starting to ring here? Okay, I'm gonna hurry up. All right, so there you go. So this just shows a, uh, is that no bell? Okay, the, uh, we made this little pinwheel of all the prairie polygons, okay? And uh, so yeah, these a whole lot in the, again, 100 acres we started. So our beloved Deer Park Prairie doesn't show up. It's not, we're not saying it's not a great place. It's just the bigger scale. So the question then is, you know, and it's a question we can't resolve here today. Well, you know, should you put your money over here into these guys or should you put it over here? Well, they both have their benefits. But again, 10,000 acre pieces, there's not many of them left. Much harder to do than a 50 acre piece that's one landowner. The Damon Prairie is one of those, you know, a lot of undivided interest lots, very difficult to put that together. But that's the challenge before us. We cannot shrink from the work that we need to do. We need names on them, no doubt. You saw when Carol's, you got all these prairies, they got names. Prairies need names because then you remember them. So Katy Prairie is the only one that you all have ever heard of. But we got the Damon Prairie. We just making that up, by the way, but we is, we're as good as anybody else to make this kind of stuff up, okay? <laughs> So we've got Deavers, Armour, yeah, I come and go. I'm not going to spend much time there. We've got to hurry up here. So how do we save it? That's the question before. You need to do all the stuff that you're doing, you know, right? Keep burning, keep mowing, keep doing the sustainable grazing. I know there's a lot of controversy with that. Do all that technical stuff. But that is not enough to save the prayer. You heard in the talk that went before, widen the circle. We got to do a lot of circle widening. We got to do some serious working with folks, okay? Because these guys are coming our way. And as the quote that I, I've forgotten that I wrote in my little abstract there, the health of the city and the health of the hinterlands are intimately connected. You cannot consider one without the other. And we need some different non-traditional allies here, okay? And you've, so this is one thing we've got to capitalize on right now. Now, 
I don't know if you saw in the paper here, uh, Kleinberg just did his, his latest uh, survey, and it turns out that flooding right after Harvey does this annual survey around here, right after Harvey, it was, flooding was number one. Now we're down about number eight or something like that in terms of flooding. But nonetheless, people have made the connection here already between the prairie and between what happens downstream. So we need to, you know, I'm not, uh, we, need, we don't need to overstate this either, but the prairies have a very large role to play. But even beyond that, we need to think about what, it, what is a prairie-friendly city. So you all have heard me say this before, those of you that have heard me. What is a prairie-friendly city? We have got to, you, to ally ourselves with those folks who are working to make a better Houston, okay? This is anathema for some of you, I know. This is called walkability. This is human habitat. This is where humans belong. They belong where things are walkable and close together. And yes, there's concrete all over the place here. But you know what? These people are living tight together. They don't have as big of an impact as these folks here. Now this is a real poster, love your stream. What are these people doing? <laughs> now look at this right here. Well, you can't read this very well, but it says, don't mess with the wildlife. Leave wildlife alone. What is the problem here? These are not friends of the prairie. These are prairie assassins, <laughs> okay? And sometimes we think, well, everything's green, is good. Let's, let's do this. Let's all live on the prairie and we'll have, they're screwing it all up, okay? If fragmenting everything, it's the road to perdition here, okay? So, and we give, we give prizes to these kind of people. We give prizes to subdivisions because they put a little rain garden out there. Oh, thank you so much. <laughs> thank you so much for abusing us and, and putting a little cherry on top. Oh, we are so, so grateful. Folks, we gotta get over that. These are our friends right here because they all live close together. They might be living in 40 houses, 40 units to the acre. These guys are living in one house per five acre. Which one does more damage? Okay, let's get over it. Now, I'm not saying that you must become urbanists. I'm not saying you have to know about sidewalks or that you have to know about setbacks or how much glass is on the street, but you need to recognize that the urbanists are your friends. And there is a big movement of front in, afoot in Houston to make Houston a better place. You know, when I started in this particular job 20 years, 20 some years ago, this was, nobody was talking about this kind of stuff. So there are natural allies who want a smarter Houston. They want a walkable Houston. There's this whole bike people out there. These are our natural allies. And we need them to see us. We need them to see the prairie as part of what makes this a whole healthy area. They are primed to hear this message, okay? But we have to come and tell them that yes, this is the prairie friendly landscape, not this. Now I'm not saying let's, you know, let's put those prairie plants out. I have a little prairie patch on my house, right? I got big blue stem, I got Indian grass, went and stole it out of a railroad siding. They're great, but they're not prairies. They are not prairies, they're nice little patches. I love being able to see the rhythms of those grasses, but it's not quite the same thing. So, little house on the prairie, let's get over that, folks. <laughs> it's not green, it's bad, it's wicked, okay? We cannot have that. We need this. Now let's put, this is the city center, let's put, the, let's put native trees out there, let's make swells where we can. We, we need that green out there, but let's not delude ourselves that that in any way substitutes for the big job, okay? But let's partner up with these folks, okay? Let's expand the circle. Let's see, go. I'm not even gonna talk about that because we don't have time, but that was a little thing we did. The point here is that we could put, we could put, we could make little patches of urban, urbanism out here on the Katy Prairie, like that. And we would, we would, the developers could make the same amount of money, 
but we would have to use things like transfer of development rights. We'd have to declare some areas that these are special and unique areas that are important to us. That's, I think we know enough now to recognize that, okay? So we could, we could do this. We, if we don't do this, we'll save a few more acres. There's no question about it. The Katy Perry Conservancy is working hard and they will have some successes, but they're not gonna save it all. So this is the kind of thing that we should be doing. And look, the duck gets it. Right? So here's the last question. Can I make a question for them? Okay, I will. Thank you. <laughs> why, why is this duck in favor of the light rail? Can anyone tell me? It's a sprawl reducer. There is nothing in the Houston area that is a sprawl reducer and an enabler of walkability and density than the light rail. There is nothing even close to it, right? the duck's best friend is light rail, okay? So again, I'm not saying that you become an urbanist, I'm not saying that you move out of the uh, suburbs, although I did have one master naturalist who actually moved into a condo tower after listening to some of that. I feel proud of that, that I was able to, <laughs> to do that, okay? But these are non-traditional kinds of allies, and we need to go to their meetings, we need to talk about what is it that makes a healthy Houston. You still go about your business, collecting seeds, burn the prairies, there's pyromaniacs here, right? There's my buddy Shackelford here, spent his whole life burning stuff up. Tried to burn me up one time, okay? We'll keep doing that, but your allies for a better future are over here. Okay, thanks very much. Thank you.